dear guests and speakers, my name is Krista Bombera and I warmly welcome you at one of the afternoon sessions of the closing conference of the Research Facility on Inequalities. This session will present the various tools developed or expanded through the Research Facility on Inequalities, which tools offer a wide array of options for both policymakers and development practitioners to tackle inequalities in their policies and strategies. In this session, we'll have five speakers, each of them presenting for about 10 or 15 minutes. After that, we'll have a short coffee break at around 4.30, and then we welcome you all back to hear from our two discussants reflecting on the issues presented to us before. A bit after five o'clock, we'll have time to answer questions from you although our team keeps an eye on your questions during the whole session. And I will have a little time after each speaker to ask some of them even between presentations. So please take advantage of the Slido app available somewhere here to the right on the button of the screen to put your questions and comments there and interact with the speakers. Let us start now by setting the scene by Ms. Anda Davies a lead economist on inequality at AFD. Let me really shortly introduce her. The current projects of Ms. Davis focus on the impact of emigration on countries of origin, for example, labor market or women's labor, also on inequalities, social cohesion and aid effectiveness. She also analyzes inequalities and migration patterns and coordinates the scientific aspects of the European Research Facility on inequalities. Prior to joining AFD's research division, Ms. Davis worked on several collaborations with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the International Labor Organization, and the World Bank. Thank you, Ms. Davis, for setting the scene for our session on tools now. Thank you so much. I have to say that it's quite challenging to set the scene for such a panel not only because the brilliant people on it probably have much more things to say about this than I do, but also because um, it is built on a concept that is quite abstract. Uh, Esther Duflo, uh, the Nobel Prize, saw economists as plumbers when they got into the nitty gritties of policy design and implementation. And it's exactly what this session is all about. How do we support policies, but also development cooperation strategies to effectively tackle inequality? The 2030 agenda pushed inequalities to the top priorities through the SDG 10, but this doesn't mean that poverty is no longer an issue or that we will stop working or researching on poverty related topics. Reducing inequalities, it's not just built on ethical grounds, although they, these should be prevalent, it's also instrumental in order to achieve poverty reduction. But while poverty is an outcome of inequality, there are significant differences between the two concepts, which render inequality reduction specifically difficult. First of all, inequality is a phenomenon that has extremely high inertia. It is much more persistent than poverty and even growth. This is partly due to the fact that intergenerational transmission of status is quite persistent. It's very strong. And therefore, the asset distribution is also persistent. But also because crucial factors that shape inequalities and, thus, and, and, poverty, and uh, policies, such as the political regimes in place, social norms, and institutions, do not change easily. Secondly, inequality lacks the sort of normative and commonly acknowledged approach that poverty has. A person can be poor, but she cannot be unequal. And inequality is a relative concept with changing boundaries, and there is no universal norm to it. We can aim to eradicate extreme in income poverty, even though some researchers say that this is quite a difficult goal to, to, to achieve, um, but we cannot aim for perfect income equality. Today, inequality is in the debates everywhere, sometimes to the disdain of the researcher who have spent decades uh, trying to draw the public's attention to this crucial phenomenon, but we lack a comprehensive framework by, of what we mean by inequality and how we can tackle it. 
we hear and read a lot of inequality has increased, inequality has decreased, but few people actually take the time and make the effort to understand what inequality are we talking about, what measure are we using, and inequality among whom. Angus Deaton, another Nobel Prize, uh, recently published a paper on COVID-19 and inequality, which received a lot of coverage presenting it as showing that uh, inequality has decreased uh, with the pandemic. And this is also the way he sometimes presents it. But what he does find is that while global inequalities among countries have decreased with COVID-19, these have increased once we weight these countries uh, with their population. And actually when the trend differs if we change the measure. And this is something we also came across uh, in the projects of the research facility. For instance, uh, in Ghana, we find that consumption inequality has decreased while assets inequalities has increased. In South Africa, we see almost no evolution of inequality when measured with the Gini coefficient, while we see a slight decrease when we look at the Palmer ratio. So going back to the Plummer story, if we want to support policies and strategies to reduce inequalities, we need to make sure that we have a consistent basis on which we can tell the story and that we have the right tools to do so. We are aware that producing measures and tools needs to be scientific, while the use of these measures and tools not always is. And this is why we need to be aware and promote the local ownership of these measures and tools. What will be presented in this session goes exactly in this direction. We have tried to identify and develop tools and measures which allow decision makers to be serious about inequality reduction. And we also took this one step further in supporting them in understanding and using these tools. Now, I would let, just like to highlight two of the challenges we were faced with when thinking seriously about inequality. These are not new and certainly not specific to the issue of the distribution, but they are crucial if we want to move forward. The first one is data, and the second one is the complexity of policy processes when it comes to reducing inequality. So starting with the data, we all say that we want to achieve SDG 10, but what do we know about its targets? Well, let's take the first one and probably the most well-known one, target 10.1, which is to reduce income inequalities. Um, it requires actually for all countries to progressively achieve and sustain income growth of the bottom 40 of the population at a rate higher than the national average. But when we look at the progress we've made so far, we see that we can only measure this for slightly more than half of the world's population. For the most recent period, 2012 to 2017, data were available for 91 countries, which cover actually 60% of the world's population. And this is not a lot. We can look at another target, like 10.4, for instance, which aims um, to adopt policies, especially fiscal, wage, and social protection policies, and progressively achieve greater equality by 23rd. And this indicator is actually the labor share of GDP comprising wages and social protection systems. And here, as you can see on the slide, the picture is even darker, or I should actually say lighter, uh, as it appears that this figure is practically non-existent for low and middle income countries in the recent period. The picture is bleak and it should actually make us realize that we cannot aim to reduce inequality if we do not have a common baseline from which we can measure the progress. Data is a tool, a crucial one for inequality reduction. There's a lot of discussion on the need to have access to top income data. And this is part of the challenge, but the need for data on inequality go goes beyond it. And as a segue, uh, the way François Bourguignon very nicely puts it, uh, the reason why we measure badly top income data, top incomes as a whole, is also the reason why we cannot do anything about income inequality. And this has to do with policies and the political economy of inequality reduction. 
The closing panel of this conference will talk about the political economy of inequality, so I will not dwell on this. I just want to say a few words on the what are the policy options that we have in order to reduce inequalities. Now, the late and missed Stephen Klassen and his team had actually proposed a framework for policy that can reduce inequalities, which shows both the complexity of it, but also the possibilities that we have. And this is a scheme that, that you see on the slide. First, you have the policies that aim to tackle uh, asset inequalities, such as education and land ref reforms, let's say. Then we have the policies that aim to improve the returns for the assets of the assets of the, the poorest, of the most vulnerable. And these would be, for instance, uh, labor market policies uh, or, again, infrastructure policies. And then we have the policies that aim to increase redistribution by the state, and these will be fiscal and social policies. But on top of these, we need to add all the other policies that impact income distribution, such as monetary policies and governance or trade policy also. And then we also need to add international trends and policies that impact intra country inequalities, such as tax transparency, such as international trade policy, and capital flows. Now, you see that while we have an idea of what are the policies that could lower inequality, we cannot say from the start which ones we need to use, nor the impact that these would have. Uh, the starting point should always be a clear understanding of key drivers of inequalities in a particular context, and then an analysis of the feasibility of each policy instrument. And on top of this, we need to add issues such as quality. Yes, we know that education policies and the, the expansion of the coverage of health systems decrease inequality, but this is only if these services, these education and health services are of quality. If not, they will just increase inequality even further. And then there's this, the issue of taking this knowledge from research to policy design. Abebe Shimles uh, was saying a few days ago in another conference that policy makers have not listened to researchers about what kind of growth does not translate into an increase in inequality. We need to think about this and make sure we have the right tools to translate research into policy design and that we will not stop there. We need to create the tools that allow us to go from policy design to policy implementation and to ensure the ownership of these tools by our partners. So to very briefly uh, sum up, tools are crucial, but so is their ownership. The current pandemic has negatively impacted the opportunities of the poorest. And this means that we are actually on the verge of an entrenchment of social and economic inequalities. So we must act quickly. Now that we have made a commitment, how do we get serious about it? This panel will give us a few insights on how do we track the impact of policies on inequality, but also poverty, and also how we can measure if development cooperation has an impact on income distribution. And while we are focusing here, on inequalities within countries, we must not forget that today the highest inequalities remain those between countries and not within countries. So I will stop here. Thank you, Ms. David. Thank you for your insight. And let me keep you with us for an extra minute with a good question we got from the audience addressed to you. Uh, the question is, what kind of indicators do you think could be proposed for development cooperation agencies. Okay, so I, I do not want to get too much into the, the indicators because uh, one of the presentations will, will be on that. But I think what is important um, for development cooperation agencies such as IFD, but also the others, is to have a clear distinction among different types of indicators that we need to, ha to have a look at the output indicators. So this would be 
uh, typical ones such as uh, the Gini coefficient, the uh, income and non-income growth incidence curves, for instance. And then we'd also need to add intermediate indicators, which can monitor the changes in the asset uh, distribution and the returns to these assets. So we can monitor things like agricultural productivity, uh, or again, um, like the incomes or uh, educational and health outcomes for, for households. We, can, we also need to have input indicators um, because for instance, projects that, that aim to improve education um, need to make, in this project, we need to make sure that we're delivered on, on these uh, inputs. So uh, do the interventions actually uh, get realized and in which conditions? And then we need to think about projects level indicators. And these might be probably some of the most difficult ones. We'd also hope to get some, in, some insights from, uh, from this panel, uh, but I guess on the project level indicators, we would need to go more towards uh, impact evaluation methods and comparisons before, uh, between treated and non-treated areas. Thank you. Ms. Davis, for your, for Ms. David, I'm sorry for your presentation and for your answer and for setting the scene. We'll be able to hear more from you later on. And this is the time now for me to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Jan Jalema, who is the Deputy Director for the Commitment to Equity Project at GDN. Mr. Jalema has actually been practicing and applying CEQ assessment methodologies and CEQ developed methodological innovations providing advice to governments and multilateral organizations in Africa, East Asia, South Asia, and Eastern Europe. And he has been leading trainings in CEQ assessment methods for close to a decade. Prior to joining the CEQ Institute, Jan worked for the World Bank as a poverty economist and social development specialist in Indonesia. Mr. Chalema, the floor is yours now. Thank you kindly, Christina, and Anda um, as well for setting the scene uh, so effectively. I uh, also want to thank AFD and the uh, EU for providing this opportunity for um, me to talk about um, the effectiveness of fiscal incidence analysis for precisely um, the issues that Anda raised for generating evidence bases on which real action and feasible policy uh, change can be made. Um, I think I would like to use on this presentation as a segue to indicate that we at CEQ Institute, the Commitment to Equity Institute, and we who practice fiscal incidence analysis, I think are firmly convinced that um, all of the research and analytics that we can generate are will always be for naught if there isn't some sort of local level ownership and indeed appreciation of the um, toolkits, the methodologies, and as well the results um, that we generate by, uh, by those who actually control the, the policy levers. And one important aspect, I think, of, of the toolkit that I will present, as well as the rest of the um, toolkits that other presenters will, um, will demonstrate here, and that we'll discuss afterwards, is that they help to create, uh, I think, a common language so that different actors from civil society, from within administrations, technocrats, bureaucrats, um, and, and lay people like myself alike are, are all speaking or can speak a common language, a language that appeals to everybody for its uh, uh, objectiveness um, for, and it's for, uh, for its transparency as well. So without further ado, I will get into my particular corner of, uh, of this world, but I think that the, um, the presentations which follow mine should indicate that the world is is, is much broader indeed, and that there are many useful tools that we have at our disposal now um, for advancing these debates about the appropriate levels of inequality and what can be done to reduce inequality that, would get, that we deem to be too high. So as I indicated, I think already, I, I, will, I am presenting from the Commitment to Equity Institute at Tulane University, and the Commitment to Equity Institute is in the business of helping um, development stakeholders and, and, and government policymakers generate fiscal incidence analyses that um, summarize the, the impact of fiscal policies in particular 
expenditure policy and education, revenue collection policy via, um, via a value-added tax or excise taxes on inequality and also poverty and other social welfare indicators. So what are CEQ assessments? What, are the, what is the fiscal incidence analysis toolkit that I wanna to talk about today? The CEQ assessments are empirically grounded, comprehensive, uh, and that's something that I'll come back to repeatedly, comprehensive and rigorous tax and benefit incidence analyses, which are transparent in method and application and which facilitate fact-based, I think that's very important, engagement among development stakeholders on the following equity concerns, but by no means are we limited uh, to these four bullets that I, that I will read through. Um, you'll see that the, the, the world that a CEQ assessment or a fiscal incidence analysis covers is, is much wider than uh, just these, the, than, that, than the world represented by these four bullets. How much income redistribution and poverty reduction is being accomplished through fiscal policy? how equalizing and or pro-poor are specific taxes uh, and specific government expenditure items. How effective are taxes and government expenditure items in reducing inequality and poverty, either overall or um, fiscal instrument by fiscal instrument? And what is the impact then of those, of, of potential fiscal reforms, either on the revenue side or the expenditure side? Uh, that change the size or the progressivity of a particular tax or benefit. So what might we expect in terms of inequality reduction if we increase cash transfer spending um, and reduce, for example, fuel subsidy spending? For what reason are they empirically grounded or for what reason do I claim that these are empirically grounded and transparent? Well, I, I don't think I can get um, through a comprehensive and, and clear answer to that on that question with just one slide alone, but I'd like to put before you uh, this sort of foundational methodological slide um, that is behind a CEQ assessment, that is behind fiscal incidence analysis. analysis. These um, boxes on this slide, on this flowchart, represent different income concepts. Um, the one that you're probably most familiar with uh, is disposable income, which is right in the middle of these, uh, right in the middle um, uh, of this flow chart. Disposable income is the income or consumption level, which we usually quote uh, poverty statistics about or inequality statistics. But there's not just disposable income. One can imagine taking from disposable income the amount of money that individuals or households pay, for example, in value added taxes. And one can imagine um, separate separating from disposable income the amount of money that an individual or household receives from, for example, a conditional cash transfer program. And up and down this flow chart are other hypothetical income concepts that include more or fewer of the fiscal items that I mentioned in, in, in the previous slide. And in this way, by disaggregating or by separating out returns from fiscal expenditures or benefits received from fiscal expenditures, as well as burdens created by revenue collection instruments, we can create different income concepts and uh, uh, examine inequality or poverty or other social welfare indicators at each of those different income concepts. And that is the way in which we at the CEQ Institute and, and via CEQ assessments determine what impact specific fiscal items are having on inequality, on poverty, on social welfare more generally. And so in this way, um, we, we mean it to be transparent. We mean it also to be empirically grounded because it is in our methodology, in our fiscal incidence analysis, the way that we practice it, we always create a crosswalk between what is happening at the level of the administration, at the level of the FISC uh, with the various expenditure and revenue collection instruments um, and the level of the individual or the level of the household as, as represented in, for example, a household budget survey or an income and expenditure survey or a living standards measurement survey. So in that way, um, the, a CEQ assessment is empirically grounded as well as being transparent. How do we use CEQ assessments? And, and when I, in, throughout this presentation, as I, as I say CEQ assessment, what I have in my mind actually is fiscal incidence analysis. Um, a CEQ assessment is a particular type uh, of, of fiscal incidence analysis and it's useful and we think um, uh, desirable to do fiscal incidence analysis, the CEQ assessment way for, for reasons that I will get to later. But in general, 
um, one could use not just CEQ assessments, but fiscal incidence analysis to um, look at the following questions or to, to, to try and help governments or, or um, fiscal authorities achieve uh, particular equity goals. So how do we do that? How, how might a CEQ assessment be used for um, helping governments achieve equity goals? Well, the first is to lay out, here's an example of um, CEQ assessments completed with uh, AFD as a partner in Kenya, in Morocco, and in South Africa, based on data from approximately five years ago, four or five years ago, um, but completed completed recently. Um, and the the idea behind this slide is to show that what a CEQ assessment does, first of all, is to quantify how much governments are actually spending on, for example, social policy. Um, as represented by conditional cash transfers, social assistance, social protection spending, education and health expenditures, as well as on how much they're spending on, on subsidies, for example, for fuel or energy or for housing. Um, and at the same time, to put in, into, into context the size of the revenues that are being collected from, from individuals. So via VAT or excise or personal income taxes or real estate taxes, um, to, to show how much fiscal agencies, the, the size of the burden that fiscal agencies are creating for individuals and households, as well as the size of the benefit pool that's available um, via expenditures. Why is that useful? Oops, I'm sorry, I've gone the wrong way. Why is that useful? Well, once you've been able to categorize all the expenditure and all the revenues that, are, that have been collected, say within a fiscal year, and then allocated all of those expenditures as benefits or the, all of those revenues collected as burdens to individuals and households, we can start to put together indicators and summaries of how those particular fiscal items, taxes or expenditures are affecting levels of poverty, um, levels of inequality, and what inequality and poverty would look like if those fiscal items weren't being executed. So here on, uh, on this slide, I've, I've, I've um, made very small, unfortunately, a graph showing how much each decile in Morocco see, receives um, when individuals are ranked by pre-fiscal income, um, how much each decile receives of the total benefits available from flower subsidies. Those are the, the blue shaded bars on the very left-hand side of this figure, uh, the figure on the left the sugar subsidy and the gas and energy subsidy in Morocco. And the height of the bars represents the share received by the decile of the total subsidy benefits available. And what's notable is that except for the flour subsidy in Morocco, both the sugar and the gas subsidy, richer households, those represented by lighter shaded bars, capture more of the subsidy benefits available. But if you go all the way over to the, the right-hand side of this graph, I put in um, the same graph, what the subsidies received represent for households in the poorest decile and households in the richest decile as a share of their own income. So even though richer households are receiving quite a bit more from the sugar and gas subsidies overall, nonetheless, what they receive represents a far, a far smaller share of their own consumption budget then do the same subsidies for poorer households. And that's why the one cannot tell from, from um, the beginning just how useful subsidies will, will, will be. Pardon, pardon me a second, my, I've got an interruption here. Okay, so I guess this is what happens when it's COVID business as usual. Um, while our presenter is um, trying to come back doing his um, fatherly duties, I think, I would also like to take this opportunity for one moment um, and share with you some important further goals of the research facility on inequalities. Let me see. Yes, are we going to wait for him to come back or we will move on the next speaker. But Hi, my, my, my sincere apologies. I, I will uh, I continue on through the, the three minutes that remain, if you, if you don't mind. 
<laughs> Thank you for being back. <laughs> Good sure. to have you. <laughs> Uh, so the, the, the CEQ assessment takes um, levels of expenditure, levels of revenue collection, and tries to determine exactly what those fiscal, what impact those fiscal instruments are having on inequality, on poverty, and on, on social welfare more generally, the welfare of individuals and, and households. Uh, here are the same um, three countries, Kenya, Morocco, and South Africa as well as some comparator countries. Uh, and, and this graph puts into perspective how these fiscal instruments, excuse me, in Kenya, Morocco, and South Africa, and the allocation of those fiscal instruments to households and individuals change the impact or change the levels of inequality in this graph, as well as on the levels of uh, poverty that exist in those same countries, so Kenya, Morocco, and South Africa, um, what, what impact those, those fiscal items have on, uh, uh, on inequality and, and, and poverty. Ooh, pardon me, I've lost my breath running up and down the stairs. Um, so in Kenya, as in the rest of the comparative countries, as well as Morocco and South Africa, the fiscal policy represented in this uh, graph does indeed reduce inequality um, by approximately nine, nine percentage points. In South Africa, the same fiscal policy, the same uh, expenditures and revenues reduce inequality by almost 20 percentage points. The impact on poverty is not always, uh, doesn't always line up with the impact of fiscal policy on inequality. So in Kenya, for example, fiscal policy, the combination of expenditures and revenues, indeed increases the poverty headcount ratio by 5.6 percentage points. While in South Africa, at the opposite end of the spectrum, fiscal policy is both poverty um, reducing as well as inequality reducing. How can we use these tools in the future? This is how we've used them as a result or, or during our engagement with AFD, but how else might they be used? Well, the, 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 the major advantage of the CEQ assessment and a comprehensive and, and methodologically um, similar fiscal incidence analysis is that the more countries that are covered, the larger or the broader is the benchmark, the benchmarking possibility of assembling all of these results for each country um, and, and using them in a common framework. So that CEQ assessment country coverage over time has come to cover quite a number of the countries, some of which were blank on Enda's uh, uh, first few slides, um, others of which are not covered. We can also use CEQ assessments and the results and indicators available for SDG 10.4.2 in particular, as well as some of the debates and, and um, discussions that SDG 1 and SDG 10 um, put forth. So it's difficult to tell, but from this graph, we could actually generate SDG indicator 10.4.2, which, uh, which will be provided now in addition to the original SDG indicator 10.4.1, which, um, uh, which track the labor share of, of income. We can also use CEQ assessments as evidence or as inputs to a debate surrounding specific equity issues, for example, in South Africa with respect to housing subsidies. We can also use fiscal incidence analysis and CEQ assessments more generally in the following sense, sustainable development plans and growth frameworks will create winners and losers. That is some who will benefit immediately and by a lot and others who will benefit by not as much and perhaps over time lose slowly from their, from their current position. So for example, will climate change and climate change uh, mitigation policies impact women more so than men? Will the funding or the revenues collected for those policies impact women or children, for example? more than men or older adults, working age adults. 
will the climate change mitigation policies that are put in place ameliorate or exacerbate the worsening inequality of opportunity that climate change itself creates? And furthermore, are there links, therefore, between SDGs 1, 10, and 4, which has to do with education, and 5, which has to do with gender equality, and 8, which has to do with decent work for all, and 13 on climate action? So CEQ assessments and fiscal incidence analysis provide an impact lens for these interdependent equity concerns. And that is all I have. And my apologies again for the interruption and sorry for taking more than my allotted time. Mr. Chalama, you stay in my heart as one of the most memorable presenters and fathers of the year of 2021. So thank you. <laughs> Let me pose a question to you. It's, um, it's a serious and complex one. How do you aim to introduce the issue of the quality of services in the fiscal incidence analysis? Indeed, that is a tricky one. The, the quality of services is an issue that cuts right to the heart of um, not just inequality with respect to income, but also inequality uh, with respect to opportunity. So not just with respect to outcomes, but also with respect to opportunities. Um, and the answer is that the more data is available on quality and quality levels of quality and quality concerns and how the quality of services varies um, by region or for men versus women um, or for children versus older aged older aged individuals the easily the more easily we can translate that into um, levels of expenditures or levels of, uh, of revenue collection that then in turn have an impact on uh, on these individuals and households to which we allocate so the more that the, the more that we know about the contours of the um, distribution of the quality uh, inherent in any service provision, either by, the, by a, a fiscal agency, um, a, a, municip a municipal level agency, or a, a district level agency, or even a national level agency. Um, the, the more things, the, the more interesting um, indicators and the more interesting uh, the debate becomes, because we can begin to examine what impact quality itself is having on, on inequality. So that's not a uh, that that's uh, that's a call in the end for more and better data to support um, to support these fiscal incidence analyses and 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 more sophisticated insights into the debates surrounding equality, not just uh, sorry inequality, not just of outcomes but of opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Gilema. We would like to have you back for more later, if it's possible. Uh, now, let me turn to Mr. Marie Lebrun, the Director of the African Center of Excellence for Inequality Research within the African Research Universities Alliance. Let me shortly introduce him a little longer. Mr. Lebrun also holds the National Research Foundation Research Chair in Poverty and Inequality Research. And he's the Director of the Southern Africa Labor and Development Research Unit in UCT School of Economics. He is one of the principal investigators of the National Income Dynamics Study. Good to see you again, Mr. Lebrun, after having you set the scene in the African Inequality Session this morning, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'll just wait to see my slides. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Um, and, uh, and to introduce you to a diagnostic tool that the African Center of Excellence has developed with the AFD uh, in, in grounding our research uh, and linking our research to, to the policy community in our countries. Um, I was going to give you some African uh, context. Uh, that seems, given Anders' uh, brilliant uh, introduction, that's hardly necessary. Uh, let me just contextualize. Um, let me skip some slides in order to, to uh, save some time and take you to this slide, which uh, goes directly to, to where uh, Anders was taking us in the introduction. Um, 
in the sense that uh, why are we doing this? Why are we wanting to understand inequalities? I thought that uh, Andre gave us a, a great introduction. Now, this is a famous uh, triangle uh, due to Francois Bourguignon um, that just shows or, or, or represents the fact that we've learned that although Africa um, has has had very strong economic growth along with the rest of the world. Uh, it's fallen off the last few years, but nonetheless, it was very strong. The, the actual impacts of that on po poverty reduction um, in, in the continent with which dominates the world poverty agenda and therefore the lowest uh, parts of the world in a, uh, income distribution um, has been very disappointing. Uh, and the reason for that is this connection, the texture of society is, is the inequalities in our countries across the continent. And so to, to push forward um, in dealing with both poverty uh, and general development, it's essential to grapple with our inequalities. And in a sense, that was the founding uh, founding premise of the African Center of Excellence for Inequality Research. It's not just a single-minded focus on, on inequality, ignoring uh, poverty and ignoring the broader development issues. No, it, it's a recognition of the centrality of inequality and inequality dynamics in understanding livelihoods of people across our continent, but across the world, actually. So, uh, so we were founded much um, in line with the start of this facility. Uh, and uh, the reason I give you this picture is to is it's from our launch uh, workshop that we had together. And there are three centers, there are three country nodes in the African Center of Excellence, uh, South Africa, uh, Kenya, and Ghana. And uh, this picture inclu um, includes really, really top, African researchers from each of those nodes, but also includes members of the national statistical offices from each of those nodes, and even from elsewhere in the continent. Um, and that's a, that's a key point to make, that, uh, that the African Center of Excellence has sought to, to produce excellent research, but in the locations that we're at, um, in uh, closely linked to our national statistical offices and the data production in our countries, closely linked to the processes that are deriving the SDGs, so that there's a link between our research and, and those processes and the social engagement uh, going forward. We, we have grand aspirations to, to, to be center stage of our continent dealing with its own issues. And the diagnostic really is a tool to support that. So uh, the diagnostic really is, is a way that the African Center of Excellence has proceeded to, to get going with its work in each country context. What is it? It's a comprehensive report, a diagnosis, if you like, of inequalities in each of the three countries. But now there's a demand for such a diagnosis from much more broadly around the continent, given given what this diagnosis actually does. And so uh, what, what do we do? We, um, we consolidate data that's around. That's why the links to the National Statistical Office is so important. We take stock, we diagnose the inequalities in each of our, our contexts with the, with the best available data, the best available research, and, um, and we, we put it together in a, a diagnosis then, what does the inequality situation look like in South Africa, one of the world's highest inequality contexts in Ghana uh, and in Kenya? Um, and what's the point of that? Well, to, if you produce that and you produce it with the data producers of the country and the SDG producers of each country, uh, that then serves as a basis for launching a national dialogue about inequality and policies to overcome inequality, but on the foundation 
of the diagnosis. And so we were successful in each of our three country contexts in actually working closely with the, with the national statistical offices, but the very people who produced the SDG reporting for poverty and for inequality and for many of the other SDGs. Um, and, and so therefore, this diagnosis then is a tool for all. Uh, the, the picture. Okay, so uh, in a sense, uh, I, uh, um, as part of that diagnosis, how do we prepare the diagnostic report? I've already discussed who we have in the room. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, not just getting the data into shape, assessing the quality of the data so that the country itself can own its data resource and start to use it. But then we need a very accurate assessment of the quality of those data, a point that under flagged earlier. Um, and uh, we also started to build the capacity in the country to analyze these data. How do you analyze inequality? How do you prepare a diagnostic for yourself? So the picture on the right is a handbook that we produced that any country can use. Uh, we've used it intensively in three country contexts, but it's available as a resource for a country that wants to produce its own diagnostic. And then if possible, consolidate the data in a data hub so that it becomes available for research use for use in the national dialogue around solving your inequalities problem. Uh, that's that's uh, not frontier, academic work, but it's, it's, it's foundational and crucial. So uh, these, these diagnostics um, in each of the three countries offer a multidimensional profiling using the data, the best we have to offer of the, of the inequality situation in three countries. Uh, on the left-hand side, I'm not sure how visible the graph is, um, but hopefully it's visible. On the left-hand side is from the Kenyan diagnostic and all it shows is the share of, of uh, in this case, per capita expenditure going to each of the deciles of the distribution. And so the top, top decile gets uh, 30, 31 or so uh, percent, but that's risen over time uh, uh, to, um, of all of the income. It's the top 10% of the population gets more than the lion's share. That's true in any country. Uh, in South Africa, that is not uh, 31, 41, it's 55 and rising. That, that uh, of the total income in the country that accrues to the top 10% of the population. And the top 1% of that uh, takes the lion's share of that as well. So it's a different texture to inequality that is profiled off the basis of careful data work. The graph on the right is a map from the South African diagnostic, and it's about the proportion of households with access to electricity by district. Um, and it took a combination of data. We need the census for that, but we also need other data sources to triangulate and make sure that that's true. It shows pockets of vulnerability. It's a very sad picture of South Africa because the most vulnerable areas are the same areas that were historically uh, marginalized under apartheid and under colonialism even, going way back. Uh, this, this map has become very important in, um, and has been adjusted through, through some research that we've done for COVID vulnerability. It's become very useful as a platform for that. Okay, so, and this morning, uh, Damiano Manda gave a detailed presentation on the Kenyan diagnostic, and there was also a detailed discussion of the South African and, and Ghanaian diagnostic. Um, here they are. All three of them uh, were produced, um, ha uh, have been produced, and, um, and in the South African case, it's even a, an official statist a statistical release of the National Statistical Office. It's South Africa's first inequality point. Uh, 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 inequality report. Um, in, the, in the Kenyan case, similarly, it's about to be released. Uh, in the Ghanaian case in November last year, it was a lovely function. Um, 
uh, where the statistician general or the director general of statistics, as they call it in Ghana, was, uh, was the keynote speaker and talking about how important this was. Um, so let's, let's uh, build on them and let's use the last few minutes to show, okay, it's a diagnostic report. Uh, there's a lot of careful work that goes into it, but it's designed to be much more. It's not, that's, this is not the end of the process. This is the beginning. And it's a consolidation process that pulls in key players around the data. But once the data is produced, there's an engagement, um, a series of engagements in each context around which we say, okay, what is this diagnostic saying? And let's start the discussion then about what are we going to do about this? And the stats agency can talk about its, its, um, its SDG reporting. And, uh, but in the picture here, uh, from the South African uh, stakeholder engagement, we have the, the gentleman standing up is, in, uh, is the head of policy in the presidency in South Africa. And he's leading the discussion. This is not uh, ASA's discussion. This has now gone beyond ASA and is stimulating a national dialogue. Uh, the people sitting at the table, uh, there's a, a lady from Oxfam, uh, South Africa, um, who belongs in the discussion too, because this is owned by the country. It's a civil engage, it's, it's a national engagement. And the other two ge uh, gentlemen are working on the President's Economic Advisory Council. And so that's the quality of the engagement. Uh, and these engagements are, are really impactful. Um, but they're, again, they're the beginning. It takes a lot of hard work then to drive off those engagements. Um, and there's great interest from around the continent in then having cross-national engagements. The national statistical officers who participated are interested in pushing the agenda across the continent in this way. Um, okay, let's uh, skip the slide. It, it was just designed to show that we had a very uh, impactful engagement in, in Ghana too. Carefully structured each step of the way is intentional. You've got to uh, you've got to put these engagements together very very carefully, um, and and you have to have the credibility to do that. Uh, otherwise, you, you know, otherwise you can't do this. So we're launching a process, not ending a project. When we do these stakeholder engagements, it's the launching of the following follow on process, um, but off the platform of having done some careful work. Okay. So just, just to push on with that point then in closure. Um, the key point of the diagnostic then is to consolidate our data, but also to build the, the indigenous relationships around the data production, SDG reporting, and then to push on into policy evaluation, again, in an indigenous way. And it's very complementary to the presentation that Jan has just given, so in the South African case, the diagnostic then was twinned. Uh, again, ASA playing a, a, a catalyzing or partnership role to a new CEQ exercise in the country with the National Treasury, therefore bringing in new data, the type of data that Jan showed, data on the taxes and the incidence of the taxes, data on social expenditures, social grants, but also, um, data on education, health. What does the budget look like? How well are we doing? We're pushing the dial beyond the diagnostic to a, a beginning to assess our policies. But in the same framework, Treasury are very interested in, in South Africa in building the same indigenous capacity to, to, produce, to use this work in their budgeting process themselves. It's very exciting. Uh, it's, it's a credit to all, all of us, really. Uh, there's similar complementarities to Oxfam. We'll hear about the Oxfam tool just now. It's very uh, synergistic to all of this, but that brings in the community side, not just the policy side, the, the community side. Um, in the South African context and, and uh, in all three nodes, spatial mapping, spatial inequality um, analysis is through the National Statistical Office is also on the agenda. In the South African uh, case, we've even made um, progress in working with our tax data, which is the preserve generally of Tomah Piketty and the, and the developed countries, but that's not good enough. 
tax data is crucial in, in addressing our, our inequalities policies. Um, okay, so ACE is a, a really excellent research center, but we've taken on this role of the diagnostic in linking our research to the policy community, and hopefully I've given you a sense of how that all works. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lebrun. And as you said, we're going to hear from the representative of Oxfam in a minute, but let me not let you go first. Let me ask you a pretty general question from a bird's eye view. What do you see as maybe the most important or most notable common traits of inequality among the three countries? Well, there are two. So uh, in, in each of the three countries, the diagnostic surface is the fact that in the daily livelihoods of people, the labor market and its dynamics are crucial. But the texture of how those labor markets work, each of the diagnostics teases out three very different labor markets. In South Africa, the labor market is much closer to a developed country, uh, high technology. We're worrying about the missing middle in our labor market. In, in, in Kenya, there's a strong focus, as, as Damiana Manda said this morning, about the rural sector and how it articulates with the urban sector and the urban informal sector and its dynamics are absolutely crucial. So that's, that's one prompt. On the, other, on the other side, the diagnostics have been incredibly useful in surfacing the type of assets, uh, including human capital assets, including education and health and the inequities in those assets by gender, for example, that are absolutely crucial to different life livelihood strategies. And I think the diagnostics have done really well on not just focusing on the labor market, but focusing on some of the wealth and asset issues that are crucial, but very different in each context. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have you soon back again for more questions. And now I am honored to introduce our fourth speaker, Ms. Anna Claver, a project manager on inequalities at Oxfam Intermont. Ms. Claver has 15 years of experience in development, social mobilization and advocacy work, and a deep passion for citizen engagement in the public and political spheres for about five years now at Oxfam. Among a lot of other things, Ms. Clever was a member of the team at the International Inequalities Institute, which developed the multidimensional inequality framework. Ms. Clever, let me give the floor to you now. Uh, thank you so much, Christina, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to the organizers, um, well, the colleagues in the table and also the audience for this space and the opportunity to present this multidimensional inequality framework, a tool that we have applied in West Africa, in Central America, and in Vietnam, in partnership with the French Agency for International Development, but also the Spanish Agency for International Development and Cooperation, and also the Mekong Development Research Institute in Vietnam. So, as you can see, and as you can as you are currently only seeing me, there's a whole team behind this work and I would like to, to thank you for them all. So please, next slide. I mean, what, what's the, in my presentation, first thing is to say, what's the multidimensional inequality framework? And um, it is a tool, in a session of tools, it is a tool to measure and understand inequalities developed in collaboration with the uh, Center for Analysis of Social Exclusion at the London School of Economics, as you just mentioned, Christina, and the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London and Oxfam. Um, from our perspective as Oxfam, as a civil society organization, we needed a new tool to help us expand and deepen our understanding and narratives on inequalities, their potential drivers and potential solutions, including policy solutions for inequality redu reduction um, in different contexts and as means to a greater impact. Uh, thinking of what gaps were we trying to address when we developed this tool, 
Uh, you are all familiar with Oxfam work and reports on income and wealth inequality, and this reflects a tendency, to a general tendency, to focus on economic measures of inequalities. But we felt that we needed new tools to move beyond, to grasp the full nature and scope of inequalities, moving beyond economics and towards this multidimensional approach. So next slide, please. Um, so what does this, this framework look like? Uh, based on the human capabilities approach by Amartya Sen, the MIF, as we, as we call it, the MIF has three dimensions, has three pillars. One, to measure and analyze inequalities, expressions or outcomes of inequalities. Second, to examine drivers of inequalities. And a third one, to explore potential solutions, including public policies. The framework, as you can see in that drawing, in the slide, in that chart, the framework captures inequalities in seven areas or domains that matter for human life, such as health, education, dignified work, or political participation, influence, and voice. Each of these seven domains has a number of suggested indicators and measures, almost 200. Uh, capturing or trying to capture the differences between groups of people. These indicators are comprehensive but not exhaust exhaustive. One should feel free to leave measures which are not applicable or relevant to one to the context and add measures that we may be or they are maybe missing. Actually, uh, or in fact, this is one of the strengths of, the, of this framework, its flexibility and capacity to adapt to different contexts. And one important thing regarding measure, the measurement dimension um, is the, the relevance uh, of variables of disaggregation. Um, it is the comparison between different characteristics or attributes of people in a given context, whether they be income level or gender, race, ethnicity, or age, uh, would allow to look at vertical, horizontal, and spatial inequalities at the same time. So, so next slide, please. Um, and, and we all know, and, and, and I'm sure that we, we all here in this conference have faced many data challenges regarding these variables of disaggregation, which is, which is something that we, that we will talk later in the, in the recommendations uh, section. So what about the... The, the context of this, of this research uh, and this tool. The framework has been implemented at different levels and at different contexts under this AFD EU research facility. It has been implemented, as I said, in West Africa, in Central America, and in Vietnam at national level. All the studies aim to look at, uh, aim to look at what were up three questions? What, what, what are the most relevant inequalities in a um, number of selected uh, prioritized domains uh, relevant to those contests? Uh, what forces are driving those inequalities? Um, as well as in finally, I mean, suggest or develop a number or as many, well, a number of policy recommendations and strategies for inequality reduction. So if we see the next slide, please, in the, what about, I mean, what about the results? Uh, just showing in this chart, just showing the results that the MIF has facilitated in its multidimensional diagnostic of inequalities in West Africa. If we look at this, at this chart and looking at inequalities, drivers, and potential solutions in five countries of this region, the main conclusions are first that intersecting inequalities. Uh, by gender, place of residence, age, and by income level, play an important role in shaping the opportunities of uh, people at every life domain, particularly in the domains of education and dignified work. Or for example, regarding spatial inequalities, that is especially important uh, in the case of health, of inequalities regarding health, which is something actually, special inequalities that um, uh, Murray Librand and Asse uh, pointed out in the session this morning about African inequalities, and, and we totally agree with that. Um, so according to these inequalities, uh, what are the policy or what are the recommendations for reducing inequalities in West Africa in this case? 
Uh, Reducing inequalities requires a set of policies clearly targeted at the most remote rural areas to correct for spatial inequalities and towards women, young people, and other marginal groups. That set of policies, I mean, the, the, the emphasis here is on the approach and the target and not the the policy pack, but that policy pack includes uh, adequate investment in basic services such as health, education, or social protection, something already mentioned and highlighted yesterday in the opening panel of this conference, and even, uh, well, that has revealed even more relevant in a time of a pandemic. Um, second, investment in agricultural policies. Uh, third, or labor rights, dignified work, and of course, invest um, and promote progressive taxes. Next slide, please. In a similar, uh, in a similar way, as you can see in the chart, these are the results of the of applying the multidimensional inequality framework in Central America and Dominican Republic. In this case, the main policy recommendation is to build is to change the productive uh, model, is to build productive ecosystem in ecosystems in areas of social exclusion, um, to bridge the gaps in the labor market, uh, and towards particularly address or targeting women again and young people again, um, along with an advocate vocational uh, and accessible vocational and educational training. And finally, just as another example of results in our research in Vietnam, um, carried out in partnership with the McKeown Development Research Institute, um, the research, the study shows that despite the strong record of the country for in poverty reduction for the last 30 years, there is still, well, there are um, persistent inequalities when crossing income, uh, income and spatial inequalities with ethnicity, particularly in the access to uh, education, health, and the capacity of certain groups to have a say or influence in, in the public arena in decisions that affect them, especially uh, women. Uh, the main recommendation in this study, for example, is that stakeholders must adopt and, and encourage a human and, and well-being approach to, uh, in the design of public policies and the implementation, and not only an economic approach. Uh, having said that, um, next slide, please, Diego, thanks so much. Um, it couldn't help in a session about tools to measure and analyze inequalities include, no, next one, Diego, please. It is slide uh, about uh, that one. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so um, as I was saying, uh, I couldn't help include one slide about uh, what are the results of the tool itself. I mean, what, what lessons have we learned? What different does the myth make? Um, as you can see, different points in the slide, but I'm going to focus on three things. First, four months ago, we asked some Oxfam colleagues, researchers, and experts who applied the myth what made it unique. And the common answer was that the, the framework gives you the big picture of inequalities, as complex as it is, emphasizing well-being and not only income aspects. Um, so the framework gives you a comprehensive and evidence-based diagnostic of inequalities, but also it provides practical guidance, both quantitative and qualitative, and actually we are working more on this, um, on this qualitative dimension of knowledge and how to, how to um, integrate it in, in the research and analysis of inequalities. Um, as I was saying, practical guidance for decision makers, academics, and practitioners to explore also drivers and potential solutions. A second thing, a second difference that the, that the myth makes it, is that it allows to look at economic, social, and spatial inequalities, also political inequalities at the same time, as well as gender, race, or other identity-based discriminations. We know that a multidimensional and intersectional analysis um, 
doesn't, it's not about adding dimensions and attributes to inequality, but trying to establish and deeply understanding uh, the interlinkages and the interactions about all those dimensions and, and, and characteristics. And last but not least, and uh, connecting with the presentation of Murai talking about engagement and, and how to, and how the, the the diagnostic of inequalities also help with this. The myth gathers multi stakeholders around the same table. In our experience, the framework is particularly useful, it's of great value in those processes seeking to uh, bring different stakeholders to the, um, to the table to discuss about inequality. For instance, in Vietnam, uh, the MIF research and the research process has allowed us to establish conversations with, the, with three key ministries, uh, absolutely key in the fight uh, to inequalities, like well, ministries of health, labor, and planning and investment, for example. So finally, um, I'm, I'm moving to what recommendations uh, come out or emerge from the uh, experience of the, of the multidimensional inequality framework. Next slide, please, Diego. Um, as you can see, uh, there are many, well, I, I mentioned some of the recommendations uh, on concrete uh, policies, on concrete context some slides ago in West Africa, in Central America, and in Vietnam. Um, and in addition to that, there are some recommendations coming out in all the studies, regardless the context. I've summarized some of those points uh, in the slides, but I will mention, or I will focus in just three points, um, main three points. First, um, and particularly addressed to international organizations, decision makers, donor agencies, and national governments involved, uh, commit or maintain and strengthen your commitment to, to mainstream inequality reduction with concrete measures such as embedding inequality reduction into your plans and strategies or monitoring and assessing development in and aid in terms of inequality reduction, something that the MIF could help with. Second, uh, something that comes out again, regardless the context, encourage transparency, citizen participation, and social accountability as means to reduce social, political, and economic inequalities. And finally, and next slide, please, um, keep supporting the analysis and the research to uh, measure and understand inequalities from a multidimensional and intersectional perspective. This research facility has been a fruitful and necessary space for exploring and exchanging about different inequalities in different contexts different disciplines and backgrounds and perspectives. We need more of this. And supporting the analysis of inequalities implies that revolution of metrics that the UNDP calls um, for, as many colleagues uh, actually have already highlighted before in this, in this conference, but not only in terms of measuring inequalities beyond economics, but also in terms of generating more and better data, which is something that, well, Anda pointed out at the beginning of this session, and also I'm sure at the year well, and, and Murray have a lot to say, a lot to say on this. Um, the multidimensional inequality framework is an indicator driven tool with more than 1000 measures, uh, which allow to identify very specific data gaps in very in concrete context. Um, this is important, and I'm doing my final point, because identifying this a specific context data gaps means identifying who is being left behind so that we can bring them or bring those gaps to the surface. There's no way we can make progress towards a fair, inclusive and sustainable world if it's not with all of us on board. So that's it, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Clever. Um, you've shared so many various tools and phases of development of tools from your experience. Can you share with us maybe what the next multidimensional inequality framework applications you may be conducting? 
Well, um, how to say, in brief, <laughs> Um, we are actually, um, we have applied, uh, well, the colleagues in, in Guatemala, for example, have applied a multidimensional inequality framework, um, and also the colleagues in Spain some years ago. And now uh, the colleagues in El Salvador, in Central America, they are actually almost finishing the implementation of this framework, or I would say of an improved framework, because we did an exercise, an exercise to reflect and evaluate about the challenges of the of the framework. So we are applying it and we well, they, they are almost reaching the, the end of this research process in El Salvador. And we are developing, um, I mean, based on the recommendations that we have received about the tool, we are developing two new, um, how to say, well, guides or practical guidance to strength the gender and the feminist approach of the of the framework meaning uh, adopting a critical feminist perspective in the analysis of inequalities and also as i said before a qualitative or a mixed methods approach to be able not to not to uh, how to say, not to rely only on statistical and quantitative data, but be able to, to capture uh, other kinds of knowledge or the kind of languages and experiences of people who experience uh, inequality in their or the everyday lives. So that would, that would be it. Extremely interesting. Thank you very much for sharing and for your input for our session on tools. We'll have more questions to you soon. And last but not least, I'd like to ask Mr. Christian Murabito to present his findings. But let me again tell the audience some background information on our panelists first. Dr. Murabito has been an international researcher and consultant with more than 15 years of experience in various fields related to our topic. He has worked with the United Nations, the World Bank and the European Commission in managing and evaluating poverty reduction and educational programs, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa. As a lead researcher for Save the Children, one of Dr. Morabito's recent commitments was a project to develop indicators to measure multidimensional child poverty and educational poverty and inequality in Italy and Europe. It is an honor to have you with us, Dr. Murabito. Thank you so much. I, I will start by saying that this is a collective work. So I'm just here presenting, but behind me, there are two other great people. One guy is Mario Negre and the other is Miguel Nino uh, Sarasua. So I'm presenting on behalf of that. I hope it will be fine. So um, in, uh, um, in the study and methodology that we develop, we start from uh, two assumptions, basically. The first assumption is that, is that impact of the development uh, cooperation interventions um, on inequality are difficult to measure at macro level eh? because there's a myriad of factors and drivers of inequality. So it's extremely complicated to see the impacts of a development cooperation program or project. It's like a bit a, a drop in the ocean, if you want, right? And uh, and on the other hand, you, you have a number of studies that try to do that and are certainly very useful, but they're sometimes complex and uh, uh, demand the technical expertise, a lot of technical expertise, uh, time consuming and also very expensive. So we start from these two assumptions and we try to say, let's try to do something basically a bit the opposite. And so we develop a methodology that is uh, rapid, basically uh, accessible. So it can be used by many people and cost effective. Uh, and we try to look basically at the first step of inequalities. So to basically, as uh, some colleagues said before, so basically to check uh, whether really in the design of the programs, and then of course, in the implementations, uh, the beneficiaries of these programs are the ones at the bottom uh, of the income distribution. So it's the basic point, you know, because after that, you can see that you potentially reduce inequality. So that's the, the idea that we develop. And it's a, it's a very simple idea, actually. And, uh, and so we've been testing this methodology with the three funded project by IFT. And now I will explain you a bit how this methodology works. Uh, first of all, 
we have a series of, uh, let's say, uh, steps to follow. Uh, so imagine that you are a person in a development cooperation agency who wants to do something, a program on reducing inequality. The first thing first that you have to say is you have to look at data. So uh, inequality situation drivers, and we explain a bit how does it work in terms of data and how you read the data, because it's not easy to do it. Eh? And uh, secondly, once you decide maybe what you want to do, what area you want to work on, uh, and then, of course, the project that you want to develop, we, we, we basically structure a scoreboard of inequality markers to assess whether inequality reduction is a focus of your uh, project program. If we talk about documents, eh, it can be a strategy of a government of your own program, and it can be do ex ante, of course, and ex post. I will show you a bit later how this works. And then, of course, you have statistical tools. You have one statistical tool that's been presented by Jan, and it's a fundamental, which is the uh, commitment for equity, and you look at whether you're doing, for instance, budget support. Huh? You look at uh, the effects of budget support operation, or if you have a program or project, you look whether this project or program disproportionately benefits the one at the bottom of the income, so uh, the 40% income group. Uh, so. That's the scoreboard. I mean, we are still editing the colors. I like the colors, but <laughs> we will see whether they will remain like that. Uh, so as you can see, there's basically a major inequality marker. So you have to raise yourself a question whether uh, the inequality is not targeted in your project or program, or is a significant objective, or is the principal objective. And then you have a series of questions that you can ask yourself and reply in order to check. It's a kind of checklist, if you want, uh, for the program design, and then some other considerations that you can uh, you can. Uh, you can take, for instance, if there could be like some uh, negative trade-off that you don't think. For example, I'm doing a, an income support program, if whether there's a negative trade-off on the labor, it's an example. Or if you think about doing something for a, a small and medium enterprise and you, and you focus not on informal sector. So in this case, you have limitations on your project. So there's a kind of numbers of, of, of steps and things that you can take into account when you're doing a project and therefore to understand ex ante ex post, whether it is in your marker, huh, when you mark it, uh, whether it is focusing on inequality or not. And then there's the, uh, um, the second the part which is the more statistical part. And so uh, we have to start from another assumption here that any project can reduce or not inequalities, any program and any policy. Eh? As John Atkinson used to say, it's, it's about how it is designed and the direction it takes, right? And so uh, we start from this up, uh, assumption and say, okay, it's very complicated to see uh, the impacts on at macro level, but you can see at least if at the start you focus precisely your program on some specific beneficiaries, and if you disproportionately um, benefit, you know, uh, your project benefit the one at the bottom of the income distribution, and it's in line of the SDG 10, if you want. In, in fact, it, it looks at the both sides of the SDG 10. One is the focus on the bottom 14 in terms of income, and the other is also about the, the opportunity part. You say that, you know, that uh, uh, social economic outcomes might be distributed equally. And so you can see, for instance, the link between this and other SDGs in education or in health, you know, whether you are um, disproportionately benefit the bottom uh, for the uh, income and wealth or not. And we relied on that on the equity tool. That is a very simple tool. It's 12 to 15 questions tailored to every country. And you identify the well quintile of uh, the participant. Huh? And you can also add questions about gender. So you can see interaction between uh, income and gender in this case, age groups, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, look at geographical level. And the other one is the very famous uh, commitment for equity that we heard before. And then I don't not going to explain that because everyone knows a bit right now. Um, so I jump on the three case studies that we did. So we take three uh, programs financed by AFD. One, uh, there are three different programs. So he wants to check whether the methodology works in uh, different scenarios. Huh? The first is a program in uh, Tunisia. It's Provil program. Actually, it was a program uh, about improving basic uh, infrastructures in 140 neighborhoods, districts. In, uh, uh, with low access to social services and high population density. Um, 
that was actually made after the Arab Springs in Tunisia. It was, you know, in the intention was to look at um, imbalances, cohesion that you find in, uh, uh, in urban areas, right? The second is a typical budget support program. So you have in Colombia, a reform of health sector that wants to be more egalitarian. And therefore um, the IFD jumped in and uh, um, support the budget for this reform. So it's a typical budget reform. And the third, it's a smaller program in terms of size in Cameroon and it's support from the, for the um, small medium enterprise in rural areas right, to improve their capacity of doing business basically. Unfortunately, we could only look at documentation analysis scoreboard for the Cameroon because due to COVID, we couldn't conduct the statistical analysis. So I will focus on the results on Tunisia and, and, and Colombia. Um, so Tunisia, as you might see from the colors of our scoreboard, um, it is, I mean, the, the um, objective of reduction in inequality is the significant objective, but we cannot say that this is the principal objective and explain you why. Because of a bit of terminology, if you want. So it's very important to look at documentation, how you write the project and how you conceive a project. Because, I mean, it was targeting on, in French, we say quartier populaire, which means like popular neighborhoods. But in reality, in the terminology of Tunisia, that's not necessarily mean uh, neighborhoods with high incidence of poverty. It's highly densely populated uh, neighborhood, but not necessarily poor neighborhoods. Huh? But you see, in any case, they have in other parts of the scoreboard some green, you know, and yellow. So it's it's a bit of mixed, if you want. So we, uh, by looking at this, uh, this scoreboard, we then conducted a, a, an equity toll survey with the beneficiaries. So basically what we did was to um, randomly select uh, 5,000 households in the 124 neighborhoods that were beneficiaries from the from the from this program and uh, and so you can see the graph there are much more results that we develop but of course that's the main results so result indicates that the project reached just over 40 percent of the poorest households in urban area suggesting that of course there's an equality reduction in effects but it's quite small because we want to see disproportionately favoring the 40 percent uh, bottom 40% income household, right? So it's just above 40%. Uh, so the share of project beneficiaries at the board for 10 goes down when you take into account the size and the density of the population within the, the, the targeted neighborhoods. So, and that's even a, a more uh, an, ad, an addition in complications. We found a degree of heterogeneity across governorates, meaning uh, the different regions. So it doesn't change much uh, uh, among, across regions and also across age groups and gender. So the conclusion that we might that we have in both the analysis of the scoreboard and the statistical analysis that we conduct is that, uh, yeah, the project reached just over 40% of the poorest households in urban areas, suggesting that it's a small inequality reducing effect. As I said, this is reduced even more by taking into account uh, density of the population, for instance, and uh, but it's still uh, quite the same if we take into account other variables, but, what we did was to compare uh, the, the, the households that they were uh, beneficiaries and tested through this survey with other urban households. But if you extend this analysis to the national level, so you include also rural area, the share of the beneficiaries, the poorest beneficiaries drops dramatically. So if you think about a contribution to a national, uh, to the national level, a reduction of inequalities, it is not the case. It can be smaller within rural areas if you just consider the rural areas. But actually, that was the objective of the project. We just extend the view uh, to check about much larger, you know, spectrum at national level. And uh, then Colombia, as you see, it's it's much more. Um, the color are different here, uh, and it's much more hectic if you want. So in the terms of the objective, it was the principal objective, because as I said, uh, in Colombia, if they wanted to uh, support a reform of the health sector 
uh, towards a more egalitarian access to some uh, specific health uh, services. But as you might see, there are some pieces that are, are not green in any way. So it, you, you might find some problems you know, within the, the design of uh, the programs. So we conducted the uh, statistical analysis, but in this case, we did on the budget, right? And uh, we use for this purpose, the commitment for equity, and we raised three questions. The first is basic. So, uh, because you have to uh, assume that budget support, meaning that the funds from the AFD goes towards the budget of Colombia. And so follow the same trend and pattern of the budget of Colombia. So you have to ask yourself the first questions, whether the budget of Colombia, uh, so the, the, the government redistribution works. And therefore, you have to compare inequality in the market and what happens in inequality once the government uh, intervenes eh? after government redistribution. First question. Second question, has budget support in the health sector achieved equalizing effects? And this we compare the concentration uh, coefficient for health with the Gini coefficient. If it's uh, below this, the, that level, it means that it, 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 is, it is equalizing. But we want to see also if it's equalizing pro poor, because you can also equalize between the middle and the high. And therefore, this coefficient must be negative. That's our conclusion. And then we will see what happened. And of course, to understand how much budget uh, goes to the bottom 40 in the health sector. Okay, first questions. Yeah, I mean, we can say that uh, the government of Colombia budget redistribution, so there is really through the budgets and the intervention of government, it happens, but it is, you know, not that uh, strong as we want to see. Look at the, the sense there. So it, uh, market income inequality goes down from 0 0.575 to 0 0.515 after accounting for monetary interventions of government. Um, so there's a limited distribution capacity of the Colombian government in this respect. Um, so with the intervention of uh, IFD, so the, the flow huh, uh, of uh, the, the, the monetary flow of IFD towards the health sector budget, now we want to see whether it is uh, the coefficient concentration of the health uh, with this intervention of the health sector is uh, minor than the... Um, minor than the uh, Gini index for market income, and it is. It's, the Gini is blue, so you see that the red, which is the health sector uh, co um, concentration coefficient, is lower, and we can assume that it's, a, uh, it's equalizing. But is it equalizing for the poorest? Not necessarily, because it's positive. You, know? you see, other uh, sectors like education in yellow equalize more and more towards the poorest. That's uh, something to take into account. And we can see that. So, I mean, uh, when we look precisely at the health sector, 32% of health spending went to the bottom 40. Therefore, less than, it does not disproportionately benefit the bottom 40. So we saw that. So um, the result indicate in distribution and distributive gaps of approximately 8% to make health spending strictly poor poor be, there are uh, equalizing, but not strictly for the poorest. Hmm? So, uh, conclusions remark about our methodology. Uh, in practical terms, uh, it's quite effective eh, to identify whether um, cooperation programs focus on the bottom 14 income groups. Um, overall, the resource uh, you know, um, underscore the importance of really considering a proper targeting, but I want to uh, say something about it. That does not mean that the project or a program must specifically um, focus on reducing inequality to actually reduce inequality. As we said, any program can reduce inequality, right? It does not mean, but we need to, of course, look whether and ensure that is looking for it. Huh? And also that uh, you need to, um, it, it doesn't mean that with the targeting only you can reduce inequality. Imagine for education, no? You have universal access to education. Universality is the best way to, as we know, to reduce inequality and to equalize chances, right? So we, we're not advocating specifically for, let's say, targeting, although it's fundamental. We can also use the methodology to see what's going on in a universal 
uh, system. Because remember, in Europe, we have universal system for education, but we still having inequality. So we, it's the way to see uh, whether we are focusing on the poor in our action, whether directly, indirectly, whether through targeting or not through targeting. That's the idea, uh, basically. And so correct the way. Voila, that's the, that's the point. Limitations, of course, is about data. Uh, in both cases, the equity tool and the commitment for equity, if you don't have data, you don't have a data availability, it's becoming extremely complicated. But we are working on adapting the same concept uh, to other uh, case scenarios and using uh, other eventual source of data, whether these are not available. Huh? So to try to work it out solutions, that's the best way we can do. The scoreboard is still quite subjective, if you think about it, because we assess documentation and therefore we have a, a subjective view on that. So we need to test and test again in order to build cases, you know, and make it, and make it a bit more objective so people can see from others what they did and eventually try to translate in their own uh, in their own uh, programs or, or, or cases. Uh, the strengths, as we said, is that it's very practical and uh, straightforward. Just to tell you that, that, that 5,000 um, households analyzed, we did with the local company. It was very easy. We take a month, uh, a month and a half, and it was very cheap. That's what I want to say. And if you do it properly, that company gives you the result. Oh, wait, okay, we worked it out. Eh? But if for a person that is in a, in a delegation or whatever, to, to can have already result, they can see you know the the the, the points. So it can be done ex ante, ex post to assess. And just to tell you that all the the study that we did accounted just for two percent of the overall technical assistance that was planned for these uh, three programs. So it's it's feasible huh? in economic terms and give you plenty of information that you can use to understand whether you are doing or not, or we are focusing or not on the bottom 40 as a starting point to reduce inequalities. Methodology can be, can assist international development agency on reporting process on achieving SDG target. And as I said, also interaction between SDG 10 and other SDGs, SDG for gender, for instance, or in terms of uh, what's happened for the bottom 40 income population children or other age groups, and also take the both sides of the SDG 10, focus on the bottom 40 and focus on equal opportunities. Thanks so much. Mr. Morbito, thank you very much. It was really enjoyable and very, very interesting. And you've concluded our series of presentations for this session, but let me keep you for one more minute. There is a very interesting question posed to you. How would you analyze the support to the private sector? Actually, we, we, we wanted to, <laughs> because in fact, uh, the Cameroon um, project was about strengthening the private sector. So in that case, we couldn't pursue the statistical analysis because through the scoreboard, we found out some uh, potential problems. Uh, one problem was, for instance, the fact that uh, there was not the selection of beneficiaries, private companies, beneficiaries that were like in, uh, in specific areas where higher is the incidence of poverty, or there could be some uh, uh, barriers, uh, especially the, the, the issue of, um, of um, informal sector, as I said before, no, that uh, it was difficult for them to access this program. And therefore, since informal sector in private sector is always the sector of the bottom 40 income population, maybe we cut out some. But in any case, uh, we wanted to do the analysis and precisely we wanted to check, first of all, the workers. So because we saw that there was an increase in the labor force of the private sector that, that benefited from this program. So we wanted to see whether these labor forces uh, increased through the, thanks to this program, were belonging to the bottom 40 income population. That was the first step. The second, let's say, circle of analysis was the area, because you can, you know, stimulate the demand, the trade into an area if the private sector works properly, and therefore you can, of course, create positive trade-off, and therefore we wanted to see whether the population, you know, uh, around the business we're belonging to the bottom 14 or not. And you can, you, we had plenty of idea, you know, to see the turnover of the company or whether it goes, but I mean, you can add questions to these statistical tools, but it's absolutely feasible to look at the 
private sector. Actually, it should be. And you can look through this methodology to all type of uh, programs, in my view, investment, for instance, infrastructure, and so on and so far. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, we'll have more in five minutes and some of it with all of the presenters together. But now let us have a strictly five minute coffee break, if you don't mind. Please do not sign off. Just stay with us in the Zoom room. Enjoy a short break and we are ready to start with our discussions in five minutes. Thank you. See you soon. From AFD, Agence Française de Développement, we want to tell you what the EU AFD Research Facility on Inequalities is, the projects we are carrying out, and our main research findings. The EU AFD Research Facility on Equalities is a program funded by the European Commission and managed by AFD, aiming to improve knowledge and understanding of economic and social inequalities, their determinants and underlying mechanisms at different spatial levels, as well as the most effective policies and approaches to reduce them. With a budget of 4 million euros for the period 2017 to 2020 and a steering committee comprised of the European Commission, AFD and AECID, the Spanish Cooperation, the programme launched more than 20 research projects in over 20 countries. This facility also aimed to engage in a joint reflection with Member States on ways to strengthen the contribution of EU development cooperation to the fight against inequalities in the framework of the implementation of Agenda 2030 and to contribute to EU development policy whose overarching objective is the eradication of poverty. The objectives of this facility are achieved through a three-pronged strategy. One. Conducting research on the determinants and dynamics of economic and social inequalities in developing countries. 2. Targeting our work in partner countries that have expressed an interest or need. 3. Support partner countries and development institutions to integrate research findings into national policies and development cooperation strategies. Did you know that the EU AFD Research Facility on Inequality has produced over 100 research papers and policy briefs? All these articles analyse the links between inequalities and a wide array of topics such as education, health, labour markets, housing, taxation and climate change. These research publications, the support of the structuring and the strengthening of research networks on the topic of inequalities, further supports policymakers and development in mainstreaming and tackling the reduction of inequalities in their policies and strategies. However, the main point we would like to share with you is that we have observed how generalised are the effects of inequalities for societies, how unequal access to public services lowers the willingness to pay taxes, how unequal access to stable jobs creates poverty traps and exclusion, and how inequality shapes perceptions and the willingness to cooperate. So, how can we help strategies to reduce inequality? Through the development of new tools such as the inequality diagnostics, and the expansion of existing tools such as the Fiscal Incidence Analysis and the Multidimensional Inequality Framework, the EU AFD Research Facility on Inequalities supported the governments in partner countries and the civil society in building evidence-based strategies to reduce inequality. All these results have been presented at conferences such as the 2018 International Conference on Inequalities and Social Cohesion, in national workshops and stakeholders' events, such as those organised in Bolivia, Mexico, Tunisia and South Africa, in a series of webinars organised in 2020, and of course, in this final conference. In this final conference, beyond the presentation of all the results of the facility, there will be an opportunity to launch a second phase of reflections and partnerships that will be articulated in the extension of the facility over the period 2021 to 2026. We will be supporting four countries, Colombia, Indonesia, Mexico and South Africa to design and implement policies to reduce inequalities. Will you join our goal to reduce these inequalities? 
help us share the knowledge on reducing inequalities. Good afternoon, if it is, to all of you. Good to have you all back for reflections from our two discussants coming up now. And don't forget, we're going to have a vivid Q&A after the discussants input this afternoon. I would like to first thank Mr. Philippe Collant for being here with us. Before I start asking questions, uh, let me introduce him shortly too. At AFD, Mr. Gallant has started as a sustainable development analyst, assessing all AFD lending operations and grants according to six dimensions of sustainable development, as well as ensuring compliance with environmental and social safeguards. He has participated in decision meetings as a reviewer and has prepared material on the sustainable development impact of the operation for the board members. Today, Mr. Gallan is the deputy head of Division 100% Social Link. His tasks include development and implementation of the new strategy within the group AFT, designing operational support in terms of inequality and inclusion, setting up new partnerships and providing guidance and methodological tools in the area of inequality and inclusion. Let me give the floor over to our discussant now. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Um, let me say first that it's very good to see a team of researchers to take the time to study and to propose operational tools and solutions to address inequalities. That's, that is very, very impressive, especially for us. When I say us, I speak about all the teams which are in the field and which are part of the executive department and uh, are on day to day um, trying to address the inequality. So thanks very much for the, all the, the, the solutions and the tools you have been designed for that. So uh, as you know, I'm, we have now at the IFD a social link division. You may ask yourself what social link means and what is the relationship between social links and inequalities. So at IFD, we have defined a new cross-cutting strategy named the 100% social link alongside with our 100% climate commitment. It is therefore a new commitment strategy which aims to accelerate the implementation of sustainable goals, sustainable development goals, the Paris Agreement, and the protection of common goods. This strategic commitment aims to increase the well being of the population and the resilience of our societies. Concretely, this strategy will support the operational divisions to reduce multidimensional inequality, improve access to essential goods and services, and promote the social economic integration of population and territories while developing participatory modes of governance. This 100% social link strategy is a result of a long process led by the research teams, the executive and the strategy departments involving regional directions and IFD representative agencies and field officers. Having said that, there are advantages 
what are the advantages for the executive and operational departments where I belong to, um, to uh, using the, the tools that she, which has been presented during this, um, this session. I say Mr. Lebrand is the beginning of the story. And uh, as part of the executive department, we have to find a way to use the tools and to see how far we can go with them. First, we have a common target. We have submitted a few weeks ago a new target at the IFD, the bottom 40. This is a, a very important step forward for us because it will give us the means to define a threshold on inequalities where we stand and the, to design the future steps to ensure that our programs are more oriented towards the people in need. Second is the geographical appropriateness. As an operational agency of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we focus our operation in countries where support is needed, mainly in Africa, but not only. Method and tools can use and be adapted in various contexts of interventions. I must say, as uh, one of the speakers said, that the key success today is to include national authorities, national agencies, and civil societies during the first diagnosis. This is a very a key in, in element and sustainable approach, which, which will ensure a cooperative and positive dialogue with the authorities on inequality. Then at, la at least the correlation with donors' financial instruments. The tools you have presented today are the great opportunity to foster fight against inequality. That is maybe very interesting for us at the, ex at the executive department is that there is a clear correlation between them and the donor financial instruments. The fiscal, the fiscal incidence analysis is a great support during our lending public policy, as what we call pre politic public, to analyze if a state budget, state policy that IFD could support is effective or oriented to poverty reduction. This will, could help us to ensure a positive dialogue with states on inequalities and propose crucial adjustments or accounting adjustments in the public policy matrix. The diagnostic tools, which were present, which was presented, um, the, the inequality diagnosis tools of the tools used by Oxfam are essential as well to define our regional and national strategy and where grants actually should be prioritized. Concerning the loans, diagnostic results could give us a clear picture for states of the existing situation on inequalities with statistic and multi-dimensional multi approach and identify sectorial loans that could be good to tackle inequalities. So the combination of the tools results give a clear picture for states, for ministries at the ministry levels and for international donors to agree on a joint and scientific analysis and therefore the possibility to support state policy and commitments on a long-term perspective for more social justice and less poverty. Now I have got a few questions as, as part of the executive department and maybe I open the, the debate. The, the, the first is, is about the ownership, as, as you mentioned, uh, and as a very important. Um, the, the, can, can tools can be some, somehow adapted and adjusted according to context and how we can present them to states in order that they can be better appropriate? This is the first question. How much? How long? Because for the executive department, you know, it is essential. The life cycle project of a project is very short. Sometimes it's less than a year. So how, we, how the tools can be adapted to these constraints? Thank you so much. And uh, I hope we'll have a, a good debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gallan. Um, now our final and last speaker, or rather discussant, is Mr. Udo Bowman, member of the European Parliament,
who will now reflect on the results and recommendations presented in this session and will elaborate a bit on the use of such tools in policy making and development cooperation. So let me first introduce really shortly Mr. Bowman. He was elected as a member of the European Parliament in 1999, where he joined the parliamentary group then called Group of the Party of European Socialists. Mr. Bowman has been, has been serving on the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee and has been a rapporteur for a number of legislative and non-legislative files. From 2012 to 2017, for me to highlight just one aspect of his career, he's led the German SPD delegation in the S&D group until his election as the first vice president of the S&D group. He's a political scientist by training. Good to have you with us, sir. Hello, everybody, and thanks, uh, Christina, for inviting me to this inspiring session. I took a lot of profit by listening to all our experts, I have to admit. Um, let, me, let me explain that I'm totally convinced now that uh, the work on inequalities is a well-established concept amongst our researchers. So I saw the tradition, I saw the new inspiring experiments of to, to structure the issue, to tackle the problem. So that is uh, uh, really, it's, it's great to be here as a politician, as a, a political scientist, I'm delighted. As a politician, I have to question myself, is the same already true for policymakers? Do we have a well-established concept on the agenda when it comes to designing development policies, trade, uh, technology, transfer, et cetera, et cetera? I have some doubts. I have to praise the fact uh, that uh, the Commission now turned to establish a special advisor on uh, inequality, and I thank the Commissioner for that. Peter Oppelainen is, I think, convinced to promote the agenda. And of course, I have to praise the AFD for all the initiatives here and for putting a focus on the fight against inequality. But look at a national agenda. There is a lot of work to be done to convince national policymakers. Look at the mainstream at the European Union. Or, for instance, take the example of a traditional promotional bank, not to speak about the, the private sector. A traditional promotional banker would say, well, I'm here to organize growth, whatever kind of. And if you start to discuss uh, about uh, uh, the SDGs, then he would say, well, the Green Deal, okay, a, a bit for the Green Deal as well. No, you say, it's not about the Green Deal, it's about the Sustainable Development Strategy, it's about the Agenda 2030, and the Green Deal is only one element of it. It's also about social inclusion, it's about the promotion of health and for education and human development. Then he would say, come on, this is going to get a bit too complex for me, uh, what do you want? And here we are. So the first thing we have to do uh, is to establish the concept of the fight against inequality as a top priority in the political agenda of main, uh, major policy making. Why? You detect the strategic function of the fight against equality, inequality if you look at the whole set of SDGs. The SDGs, unlike the predecessor concept, has the idea that everybody is in a developing country, the North as well as the South, and it needs horizontal initiatives. But at the end of the day, the concept of a sustainable society can only work out well if citizens, the members of the society, are going to become the co-producers of the new agenda. If they have ownership, if they can establish a collective identity of where to go to, and this is much easier if you enable people, if you empower people in the frame of an equal society. And that is 
underlining the strategic function of fighting inequalities as a major tool for achieving the whole set of where we would like to go. So this is my general idea. We have to fight for this agenda because it's key to uh, set up a new development policy, a new technological transfer policy, a new idea of our social and economic model of development. Thank you, Mr. Bowman, for contemplating how it may be ensured that inequality becomes and remains a top item on the agenda of policymakers in development institutions. But let me go a little deeper with you. Various tools which could support the mainstreaming of inequality, mainstreaming, were presented in this session that you took part of all the time, um, all, all the session. Based on your experience as a politician, could you please reflect on how efficient do you think these tools will be, both for policymakers and for development institutions? Well, I think we have to, it's, it's a twofold exercise for me. Uh, first of all, we have to establish the principle, the general clause, the general idea, the general approach of how to spend our money, of how to redefine our legal framework of how to use all our capacities to turn from a visual, vicious circle into a virtuous circle of communication between the North and the South. So this is the, the, the key idea. Once you have established this as a general approach, the main general approach, then it's about fine tuning. And when it comes to the concrete budget support programs, when it comes to the multi-annual indicative programs, then we need, and all the experts have already elaborated on that, we need two things. We need local ownership, because civil society plays a major role. Our people on the ground play a major role, otherwise we cannot uh, deliver. It's not a, it's not a top-down thing. It's a collective uh, bottom-up issue that we are talking about within a general frame, within a redefined general frame, it's going to become a bottom-up issue. And the bottom-up issue needs both things. It's, it needs ownership. Um, people have to commit themselves. We need empowerment of the people. And we need flexibility. Because as one of our experts put it, um, we have to check out who is left behind and for what reason. And how can we change a situation within the relative specificities? Uh, in uh, sometimes it's more gender, sometimes it's it's urban rural, sometimes it's most of the time it's it's uh, uh, poor and rich. Uh, rich on the other hand, but the whole um, polarization in an unequal society has to be captured in the picture of how to introduce your local initiatives your regional renewed programs and your national setup. Thank you so much, Mr. Bowman. And um, if you don't mind, I'd like to open the floor up to all of the other presenters and speakers and engage them and um, give them the floor to ask you questions as well. And I would like to ask you to stay with us and um, if you feel ready, answer some of the questions that we have from the audience to all of the panelists and presenters and discussants. Let me ask now I see everyone with us. If you can, uh, or if you may, or if you would like to engage Mr. Bowman as well um, on some of the questions. He's both a political scientist and a politician and uh, let me first start the conversation with a question to everyone, to all speakers. Can these tools that you've been explaining be applied to improve the targeting of public investment projects vis-a-vis -vis the bottom 40% blending operations? Or are there IFIs that have similar methodologies I guess this should be Mr. Morabito answering first. I think he used the 40% the most. I will do it. <laughs> 
Certainly, yes. Actually, it has been designed for designed for this, this, not the specific purpose of <clears throat> increasing the effectiveness of the uh, public investment, because we look mainly at at the you know the work of uh, development cooperation agencies and programs. But still, remember that any program does by a development cooperation is in line eh, with um, a government program and if this it looks for instance at i'm thinking at public works uh, like uh, infrastructure for instance uh, that could be a fundamental tool to uh, to check precisely the direction of this investment i mean just a, a, a brief a brief uh, parenthesis uh, we know by fact that for instance um, rural roads and electrification that's that's a, that's a major huh? public investment in general or public private in any case you know it's an investment uh, reduce inequalities that's you know empirical uh, demonstrated still we can have other investment that supposedly do so like uh, you know cabling uh, with uh, with internet some areas or stuff like that because i think we're talking about this type of investments you know that they've done through uh, you know um, parallel agencies development agencies well in this respect you might ask yourself as i said before uh, to whom is going to benefit benefit most and these tools can tell you uh, since the beginning and the design of it to whom is going to benefit most to who is the, the people are going to use most this in which area you're going to do that you know all these kind of questions you can reply through this tool i'm now think talking about, about you know also the others i think it's <laughs> it's 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 a collective uh, thinking in my view that's our essential precisely to to check whether they will disproportionately impact the bottom 40 or not hmm. Thank you. Um, may I ask the other participants if they would chip in? I think Mr. Lebrant is changing on mute. Yeah, I'd like to come in and just uh, and just extend uh, that, uh, you know. And so uh, when Christina was talking, he was talking a lot about in a spatial sense, like where are the pockets of the most vulnerable? Um, and I think that one of the links precisely to this public investment uh, issue is, uh, is, is most, most uh, public investment strategies are, are not just, are not macroeconomic, they're actually uh, supporting a development bank or supporting some municipal or local issues. And I think there's immense ability in these tools to help uh, to help profile what are the vulnerabilities at the local level. So in, in, in our case, the, all of the work that we did on spatial inequalities, there's a lot of detail there that can be drawn on to profile regions. And that meshes in the South African context uh, and probably in other contexts too, it meshes greatly with the with the AFD's focus on supporting municipal infrastructure. It's not just infrastructure in general; it's supporting uh, local districts because that's where people live, right? People live somewhere in a particular space, and the investments take place into particular spaces, and they're targeted into particular spaces. And so, you need to hone. Th that local level context and its detail is very, very important to the return on the investment in, a, in to use that sort of crash language. But what is a return on investment? Return on investment is empowering people's livelihoods where they live in the circumstances that they live. And there's a very good meshing of these tools with, uh, with that to, to uh, so, so that was my, my input on, on that. Um, would you allow me, uh, Christina, a comment in general on um, on uh, 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 Mr. Bullman's uh, statement? Really, really profound, actually, statement about changing the the narrative and the st the strategy, making people think about not just us, who are who are the converted already about the usefulness of an inequality framework. Um, I just wanted to add the point that, uh, because of course this is the language that the World Economic Forum talks about, the G20 talks about this, about social cohesion and the necessity for societies to have a social compact and to, uh, but it comes home to roost 
when uh, when people like Mr. Wilman, and when you're talking to to countries and you're saying, look, this is the way sustainable development happens. There's a necessity to be um, to be missionary about it, to really believe that that this is the way to go. And, and the way you interact with local officials. In, in other words, I'm endorsing what you're saying, but, but saying that this, this panel represents a lot of progress in pushing on, but now it's quite important that, uh, that we take that into our engagements. Uh, you know, and so, so in, in my experience in, in South Africa, I have a lot of resonance with this because this is where the society knows that this is, this is how we're constrained. In, in Ghana and in Kenya, it's not quite the same thing. And there's a lot, a lot of need to take this, this message that this is the approach into that space. I, I just thought it was a really useful insight, but I, I think that the, the road forward is quite clear that we need to be very articulate in, in taking that forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me take the opportunity to hand it back to Mr. Bowman. Thanks very much uh, for this uh, uh, comment. Yes, I agree. Uh, uh, and uh, sometimes I cannot deny the political analyst. So, uh, and and I, I see there is a certain gap between the language and the headlines. They become better and better, and the implementation of our policies. And here uh, we have a hell of a way in front of us. And of course, our endeavor has to be to, to enhance uh, the road and, and to speed up the road to sustainable strategies. Uh, the very question uh, from Christina was also about investments and it was about blended finances um, and uh, a quick comment on that perhaps also. Um, our data, our experience so far tell us um, that uh, it doesn't work the poorer the countries are. In LDCs, it's much more complicated to have a successful strategy uh, using blended finances because the urgent need is the public good. So the urgent need is health, is education, and human development. We have to start with that always, and we should never lose it as our uh, focus point. And if you go to private investment, which you need, of course you need, then we should uh, take on board some experiences we did in different regions and areas. I remember very well last mandate when uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, the commission's president, took up what we wanted to have uh, in this mandate, uh, a big investment program, what he thought uh, would be work out in the FC, so-called FC uh, structure. Popular name was Juncker Fund. Juncker Fund number one, Juncker Fund, uh, number two. I was uh, leading the legislation for the European Parliament and both. And I can only tell you that the more intermediate actors you have, the more you also have to deal with institutional conservatism. That is especially true for uh, promotional banks. They do what they ever did because they know best, whereas politicians know nothing about their business. So what you really need, this is their uh, anticipation of the situation, but what you need here is a strong framing exercise by legislation, and you need tough scrutiny, and you need a debate about governance culture uh, at the very end of uh, uh, setting up this, uh, for this fund uh, for the European Union domestic policy issues, we ended up to set one institutional expert on behalf of the parliament in the supervisory entity of this new fund, because we needed to have transparency and we needed to have a grip on the practical implementation. It is not enough to listen twice a year to some report from uh, somebody. So this is nothing. You need to have a grip on what is going on and you need to change the rules of the game. And that sometimes you can uh, only do from the inside. So I'm, I'm not only talking about the EIB, but uh, I, I wouldn't neglect that I'm also talking about the EIB. 
Thank you so much. Uh, let me use um, the remaining time that we have for one of the very, very interesting and important questions asked to all of you. Let me start with Ms. Anda David answering. What tools do you think would be critical to make available at the local level? How could local and regional governments be empowered to take ownership of these tools? Ms. David. It's a, it's a very interesting question, and indeed, it's something that um, that we we came across also in the first exercises. So, uh, the I'm just going to take the example of the South African diagnostic because I've worked intensively on it with with Marie. And what is interesting to notice is that one of the first reactions from stats says so from the National Statistical Office uh, when working on that diagnostic was, okay, once we finish this we need to then do a sort of road trip across each province and discuss with the provincial governments on how can, how do they see the reality reflected in the diagnostic and how we can work further. And that, that's quite important because what we see is that inequality is very often a special a spatial issue. Uh, we have, cringing spatial inequalities all over the world and in each country. And in order to, so, to go towards reducing those kinds of inequalities, we need to improve the ownership of the tools by, as you say, the local government, but also try to reinforce the capacities of local government in terms of data production, in terms of data analysis, etc. cetera. Um, and having this push towards trying at least to compute most of the indicators at different spatial levels could be a first st step because it allows us to have a clear understanding of the local realities of inequalities, but not just inequalities. So the mapping of inequalities, as we have started to do it to, with the African Center of Excellence for Inequalities Research, is uh, is a good step forward. It would also be interesting, for instance, to run the fiscal incidence analysis on uh, provincial or, or municipal budgets. I, I'm not sure we have the data to do so, but it could also be a, a way forward. Thank you so much. Uh, let me turn over now to Ms. Anna Claver uh, from Oxfam. Well, thanks so much. Uh, uh, just to words I would say, I totally agree with what Anda uh, just said about supporting local authorities and uh, well, and different actors to to strengthen their ability and um, capacity to use these tools. But I would like to say also that there are already many local actors. Um, who are already empowered and who are using their own tools, their own understanding and their own, um, how to say, claims on inequalities. Uh, and maybe uh, our mission is um, as well to, well, use these tools, uh, for example, in the case of the multidimensional inequality framework, uh, use it in a very flexible way, trying to build on, on the previous work that uh, different actors done and are already doing. Mr. Lebrun? No, I think uh, I, th I think you should give uh, your a, a turn. I can just, I'll pause. Okay, you were just nodding that I thought that you had some really strong comments. I have a bunch of questions to Mr. Jalema, specifically, besides uh, being interested in what he has to say about all that we've been talking about, because he hasn't had a chance to be to take back the floor yet. But let me add two questions to that, if you don't mind, Jan. Um, how do you see as a practitioner, a seasoned practitioner of methodological innovations, all of the tools and methodologies presented here today and their use. And could you maybe elaborate why the effects of the same fiscal policy have such drastically opposite effect on poverty in different African countries? How can this be translated into recommendations for the policymakers? These were two important questions bunched in one to give the floor to you as one of the last commentators today. 
And we're, of course, interested in all the rest of what you have to say about previous um, comments. Thank you kindly for giving me a um, place of, of privilege here at the, at the last uh, so for some um, con concluding words. Uh, the, the, the questions that you asked are also pertinent and, and allow me to come back to um, a, a favorite topic of mine, which we haven't focused on during this discussion, which is absolutely fine, but which is equally relevant, I think, for all of the issues um, that we're discussing, and particularly these, these ones that are coming up um, at the end. And, and uh, after having listened to uh, Mr. Bullman and, and, and Christian also, and, and all of the other presenters, that um, we, we, we aren't we, we haven't explicitly mentioned revenue collection and the revenue side of the fiscal ledger and, and what revenue policy in particular means both for the impact of, of policies on inequality and, and poverty. And that, that speaks specifically to um, the drastic uh, contrast in results um, among different African countries, but also in, in, in all other regions of the world with respect to um, fiscal policies impact on, on poverty. The, the, the reason behind it is that different revenue collection policies that there are and who they create burdens for. That's an empirical result that we can discuss in, in, in great detail and by type of, of tax or type of revenue collection instrument. But I think there's also um, an issue that speaks directly to, to local ownership. So there's a desire on all of our parts and I think also for local actors as well to better understand and, and use more effectively all of these tools, but also to realize that the the development plans, be they locally generated, be they nationally generated, be they generated in international fora, um, and sustainable development planning also in some sense depends on or creates public goods that in, in, in the best case scenario, we would all want to be funded domestically. In other words, the, the public goods which are being created through these investments in education and health and in, in clean water, in roads and ports and so on and so forth, um, that we would want them to be funded by the very people, the very same individuals for whom they, they create public goods. Um, and in, in a lot of cases, um, MFIs, IFIs, donor agencies have great ideas for investments, but those investments will outlast the, the funding cycle uh, within the MFI, within the IFI. And in the best case scenario, we'd like the local counterparts to agree that the investment in the education system in, in, in clean water were good ones and see the wisdom of, of the investment and see the inequality reducing impacts and so on and so forth and therefore say uh, among themselves we agree that going forward the, the, the positive impacts from this investment are something that we would like to donate our own our own hard-earned income toward and the, the, the most efficient way for that to happen is for everybody to agree also on the revenue collection framework and agree that it's not creating inequalities where there shouldn't be inequalities, that the poor shouldn't contribute more than their fair share of revenues which fund uh, public investments as well as um, security services and law and order and all of the other things that, that governments do. So I, I think, uh, I think uh, I've answered most of the salient points that, that you raised or the salient questions that you raised through this focus on, on the revenue side of things, which we've, which we've not spoken too much about today, which is okay, but I, I want to make sure it, it, it remains in the back of our minds and also going forward um, that, we, that we are equally aware of uh, what revenue collection and revenue policy can do in terms of uh, fostering local ownership of, of development strategies and, and, and growth frameworks and so on and so forth. Thank you for bringing it up, for bringing it into the conversation before we wrap up. And before we do wrap up, I'd like to um, give the chance to anyone who would like to comment one more time before we finish the session. Um, any chance for last remarks or a reaction? Seeing all your smiling and ready faces. Thank you, thank you really much. It was very, very insightful, important. Congratulations on all of your work, which you'll have to keep up. And thanks for the audience for the smart and important questions. And we would like to see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock and at 3 p.m., of course, we will start tomorrow morning by very specific testimonials on the country projects. It's really important. And then see you at three tomorrow afternoon. Thank you all for being here today. Have a nice 
afternoon or whatever you have now. Goodbye.